it's uh, it's four o'clock Copenhagen time, so we can slowly start, and then hopefully we can uh, also maybe more people will slowly arrive. Uh, but uh, I will just give a short introduction. It's uh, a big uh, pleasure for me to to host uh, this session today. And so it's part of this series that Time Perspective Net Network is currently undertaking together uh, with the Danish Institute for Study Abroad and its students and the other professors. And it's been uh, an interesting development because of, uh, of this uh, sudden ev let's do everything online we actually can have uh, an opportunity to invite uh, more people into our classrooms otherwise we would not be able to invite so we take this in, uh, this opportunity and uh, to the fullest I think and uh, so it's uh, my pleasure also to um, uh, to uh, to introduce you to uh, the other uh, people in our panel today and I think I will stop maybe sharing this screen so that we can also see uh, all of us. And so today we have uh, David Fossen, who is my colleague at DIS, and also Cyril Akar, whom I had the pleasure to work together back in, uh, in the days in Umeå University in Sweden. And so I, I think I would like to also just to uh, give a floor to you uh, guys and girls and kind of like to introduce yourselves. And then we also explain what are we doing today here? <laughs> I don't know if David, if you would like to take over for now. Sure, sure. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, perfect. So I'm delighted that uh, Anna has opened this forum up to uh, to to me and to my class, uh, and also to the other guests from uh, to save it on to the other guests from the Time Perspective Network. It's wonderful all to be together. I want uh, very quickly to explain. Um, how today came to be. Um, this began as a thought experiment that Anna and I dreamed up, and then we decided to involve uh, my students in my environmental economics course at DIS in it. And it's a big course. There are two sections, so there's almost 50 students. And uh, we thought that the experience that our students had gone through at DIS, where we had a wonderful half semester together, including some travel, some real bonding experiences, we really enjoyed uh, this dislocation experience for the students from America being in Denmark and learning about the world through exploring Europe. And then it all came to an abrupt end when uh, the COVID-19 pandemic reached Denmark and we shut down DIS and sent the students back, mostly to the United States, but we've got some students in, uh, in China and Singapore and India. And now we're all going through this global pandemic together. And we're going through it from a genuinely global perspective because we're all around the globe. Um, and uh, I'm in Denmark, none of my students are. Uh, and uh, one thing that we're trying to learn from in this class, which is about the environment and poly res policy responses to the environment, uh, we're trying to learn from this, uh, well, you could say, uh, not exactly fortunate, but definitely uh, promising global experiment in comparative national policy. We're trying to draw some lessons from that the comparative national policies with regard to coronavirus um, to how we can also understand different policy options when it comes to climate change. So really fast, I want to uh, introduce you to our thought experiment, and then I will uh, turn the floor over uh, to our other speakers. So I'm going to try sharing my screen. I have a very short PowerPoint for you. All right. So this is just five slides, so don't worry. Um, Let's try it. Okay. So uh, can you all see the cover slide? It should be the same as the cover of the, if you please nod, yes, perfect. Okay, let me just go straight into it. So this is the uh, cartoon that inspired Anna and me. You can see on the bottom left, you've got the, the curves of COVID-19 and the, the need, the urgent need to flatten the curve so we don't overwhelm our uh, health systems. And you see two sciencey medical people in white coats looking at these curves. They're totally occupied with this problem. And what they don't see, because it's behind them, even though it's much bigger, actually, uh, are the curves of climate change. And I, I think I've said this before to my students, but I'll say it again. What I love about this cartoon is that it illustrates the fact that there is an analogy, but also a, a disanalogy between the COVID-19 pandemic 
and the problem of climate change. I mean, there's a lot, and so the disanalogy, you can see that the curves of climate change here are, are they're waves, they're not, you know, pandemic curves. But still, uh, we, uh, we need to adopt a, a, a policy approach that both is, you know, short term, we want to into account what are the long-term effects of whatever we're doing and in the case of COVID-19 you know can the economy survive what do we have a plan for recovery and we have to make similar calculations short-term medium-term long-term future calculations when it comes to climate change policy all right so uh, here are the six countries that are at stake five of them were part of the experiment explicitly and then the sixth one is kind of in everyone's mind the sixth one is of course the united states and here you can see um this is a curve that uh, isn't uh, adjusted for population so uh, the total number of cases uh, is on the left-hand axis, and you can see the United States has just far more cases um, than the other countries. But what's interesting to look at are the the shapes of the curves and how different countries with their different national approaches have more quickly or more slowly been able to bend the curve. And I mean, South Korea and the United States are clearly very different in, in terms of the results that they've seen. So I, I bring up the United States because uh, the vast majority of the students uh, moved from Denmark to the United States pretty early in this graph, like around around here, and have been, um, because uh, the students are at DIS and are constantly hearing from me about what's going on in Denmark and what's going on across the pond in Sweden, very aware of these national differences. Um, I miss the students, the students miss me here. And so we're thinking a lot about oh, the way life could be and uh, Anna and I were thinking that this could be a really interesting uh, occasion to explore both national differences themselves, but also, and more importantly, the way that our attitudes toward the future shape which policy approaches appeal to us most personally, and also when we use our, our kind of rational minds and think about what policies make the most sense. Um, so we took advantage of the fact that Anna's uh, methodology, you know, Anna is a, a, a like lifelong student of time perspective and how we measure differences in time perspective. Um, and she has found fascinating new applications of the of the Zimbardo uh, methods of classification and surveying and analysis, um, also to country comparisons, that we thought we would try an experiment with the students, where first we we gathered their time perspective data, and then with really explaining it to them, we organized them into groups uh, based on similarities in time perspective, and then we set them to work uh, doing some country comparisons. Now, just some background for why we chose the countries we did, and this is older data, this is from early April, but it's, it's pretty uh, violently uh, illustrative. Um, what you see here is, uh, this is um, the Oxford COVID Tracking Center has uh, developed a stringency level index for government interventions, like lockdowns and things like that. And they've, I mean, it's a simple linear scale um, and it's a useful way to compare countries. And one thing that you see here, not, not all the five countries we were working on are represented here, but you can see Sweden is a very interesting outlier of a country um, that has uh, you know, quite a few COVID-19 cases, but not nearly as many as the countries that are really, really suffering um, and extremely lax uh, lockdown policies. So it's kind of a, a, almost alone occupying this uh, area of the chart. And right next to Singapore, and as you may know at this point, back then Singapore had relatively few cases and a pretty lax regime. Now there's a second outbreak in, um, in Singapore. And then all the way up on the other side, you have Italy, which was really, really uh, doing very poorly in early April and also had uh, the most stringent lockdown in the world uh, for a while. Um, and uh, South Korea is the reference case because that's the country that seems to have you know, licked the epidemic earliest. And, uh, and, and they are interestingly right around the trend line when it comes to how stringent a country's policies are and how many cases they have. Um, this uh, also from the Oxford group is a, is a, a chart that illustrates a stringency over time. And even though, again, it's not exactly the same five countries that we chose, but several of them are on here. Um, what you see here is uh, the relationship between how quickly a country cracked down and how much it cracked down and what actually happened with the caseload. And uh, what you can see is there's some countries that were kind of ahead of the game, like South Korea. 
cracking down and ultimately not having to crack down all the way to the max and getting a handle on their caseload and ultimately really crushing the curve. Um, the opposite uh, number would be the United Kingdom. And as you may recall, in March, there was this very long period where the UK government seemed to have a policy of kind of just waiting and letting everybody who was, who was below 70 get infected. They quickly changed their mind and have caught up. And you can see that their curve really uh, rose very quickly. Interestingly, people think of Italy as a disaster. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the death rate has been horrendous there, but it's, a, it's actually a very country with very old population. And when you look at uh, Italy's policies, um, comparing Italy to the United Kingdom, Italy actually looks a lot more like South Korea when you, when you look at, at this measure of astringency over time. So um, the students are looking at all this from the United States. And, you know, at the time when we started this, the U.S. had been relatively slow to react, certainly from a Danish perspective. Um, but, uh, but since then, things have changed. So this is old data. But anyway, um, it gives you an idea of why we thought it would be very interesting for students, mainly in America, but some also in East Asia, to, do, to look at some of these country comparisons. Okay, just one more slide. Um, uh, the five countries we did choose uh, to look at, we wanted to avoid the United United States, we want to avoid China, so countries where there's a lot of rhetoric. We did include Sweden, though, because DIS has a location in Sweden, and in Denmark, we're constantly comparing ourselves to the Swedes. And with coronavirus policy, there is uh, a, a, just a tremendous split between the Danish and Swedish approaches. So we thought it would be very valuable to include Sweden. South Korea is the the index case that people use because it's, it had such an early epidemic and succeeded so well in, in, in suppressing it. And Italy is, is simply fascinating. There's so much great data on the epidemic in Italy. And we also included Germany because uh, from a Danish perspective, Germany is the big brother, uh, the, the big brother country that you always compare yourself to when you're not comparing yourselves to, to Sweden. And then there's one more thing about Germany that I find really fascinating, which is that Germany, um, According to the, uh, the the Interior Ministry, they um, they had a kind of panel sit down and develop what would be a great policy for the country, and they actually adopted a policy that was put out there by. Um, by a blogger named uh, Thomas Pueo, who is not an epidemiologist and not a virologist. He's like a teacher like me. And I kind of find that amazing that a that sort of somebody who's into like science education managed to convince uh, the government of one of the most you know powerful economies in the world to adopt uh, his pet uh, policy. And they've adopted it and it's actually worked fairly well. So um, uh, we thought that these five countries would be very interesting to investigate also, you know, given that I'm in Denmark and I'm constantly looking at Germany and Sweden. And the data that we've uh, received has been extraordinary. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but now I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, now you have an idea of what the experiment was. Oh no, um, looks like Zoom has collapsed. All right. It seems like we lost uh, David for a moment. Uh, let's hope that he will uh, re-enter the room uh, very shortly. But I'm thinking in the meantime, uh, maybe we can also uh, give a, a, a floor to Seville to also just to introduce uh, herself. By the way, I'm sorry. I, oh, I Zoom, now, now you're Zoom back. Died. Zoom okay. died, and but now it's 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 back again. And I just have to figure out how to not screen share anymore. But maybe Anna, you can. Um, you can yes. annually uh, quit the screen sharing for my, my other self. I probably appear as two Davids. Ah, yeah, I can see that. Um, so maybe if you can eliminate the other David, the one called David co-host, then <laughs> that David doesn't really exist. It, it, Zoom somehow just crashed on my computer. Um, if, yeah, exactly. But I still can't really stop uh, your sharing. Uh, Anna. Anna, only a co-host could share the screen. Ah, yes. So now that I'm not a co-host anymore. Yes, you should have, have to be a co-host to share the screen. Exactly. And Anna has made me no longer be a co-host. So the problem is I'm, I'm here, but I'm, I, there are now, <laughs> I had to rejoin Zoom. So it looks like there's two of me. And the other one of me, who isn't really there, is like hijacking the screen. Um, yeah, and ah. I, I can't really stop it. 
<laughs> ah, okay. Can you make me a co-host, maybe? Or maybe share your screen? I can try to share. Uh, do you... I also to connect two times, and there is two olders also. I, do, I don't know why. Maybe to, today Zoom has some kind of problem. Problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had I had some issues earlier today when I was zooming as well. So I, I feel very bad because I've been basically been cloned, and what's happening is this: our show is being hijacked by my clone. Uh, so it isn't me, but it kind of is me. So I feel sort of partly <laughs> responsible. <laughs> I don't know this weird mix of guilt and innocence. Um, so because I can like I can affect my own like the real me, but I can't do anything about my clone. Um, like I, I, I also can't stop it. Like I said, like you have stopped. Uh, I mean, here. <laughs> and uh, if I share something else, then uh, does it show or not? Yes. Ah, there we go. Okay, perfect. Now it's stopped. Problem solved. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so when we make the recording, we we can go back and we can edit out these minutes, and they won't have happened. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. But I think, yeah, now, now that we are uh, all kind of like back on track, maybe we can also give the floor to Cyril to introduce herself. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. I'm joining this uh, conversation from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, actually, I have no research or no, uh, let's say, uh, other than daily curiosity, no specific interest in the COVID-19 pandemic and how countries are responding to it. That's because we are all probably tired about it and we are also uh, experiencing hard times with it. But otherwise, I was interested uh, in this invitation of Anna and David once they somehow related to it related it to environmental economics and you know climate change issues so that's why I think I am here or that's why I think they have invited me here uh, so I'm an economist uh, and I'm doing research mostly on uh, climate change uh, policies especially energy policies that have an impact on climate change directly or indirectly and also uh, some uh, research on uh, ecological footprints uh, of consumption and production, as well as the uh, natural capital accounts of countries, how they make use of their natural capital and how they account for it. So uh, these are my spe special interests. And uh, nowadays I'm also teaching online uh, one environmental economics course and uh, one uh, macroeconomics course. Uh, today I, I had an online course as well previously to this uh, session. And uh, yes, I'm finding it hard to adapt to this uh, environment, but still uh, we know that it will continue for some more time and uh, maybe it's a way to you know, rethink of our ways of communication and uh, of uh, instruction and everything. So I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for your invitation again. Uh, th th uh, thank you so much, uh, Cyril. I, I think I, I would like also to give a little bit of context, like why uh, I invited Cyril, because when we were working together in Umeå University, so what I know from uh, the research that Cyril was doing actually is very much related uh, in terms of what we are and are discussing today. Although pandemic is one of the, you can say, it, we used it as a case study, but we can also take some other cases in terms of, because in any, in any ways, how a country is uh, ruling out a particular policy towards the pandemic, it is also using its a particular capital. And then it's, uh, I know that civils, uh, 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 um, main points of research were mostly how, for example, Norway is using uh, different uh, way, uh, their resources, also like how do they project into the future and how they build up a particular policy. Is that also something, do they make uh, a, a, a revenue right here, right now, or they create something for the future? And I think with this pandemic, it's also like a case in terms of this different country, how do they invest different resources 
in a way. That's uh, kind of like where I see the link. And uh, I see uh, David is nodding, so maybe you would like to chip in right uh, now. And then, uh, because I was thinking, I could briefly also give uh, the introduction to uh, to our village study, because I think it kind of, it will make like a link between you know, all of those uh, things. So if David, if you want to take over. Super. Um, uh, there, I have my thumbs up because, and I, I agree. I think your village study would be really wonderful to bring in. Um, I've, uh, I have to say, Sibyl uh, uh, has an amazing CV in terms of the things we talk about in our class. And actually, I, 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 I didn't even tell you about this, but a month ago, uh, I, I set the class to work looking at environmental taxation policies all across the EU. The EU 27. There actually, Britain would have been a great case, but we restricted ourselves to the, the 27 remaining countries, and uh, and we we created a kind of Wikipedia of uh, of uh, sort of co pooling our knowledge about the different policies uh, studied there. And uh, what we see is even within the EU that has such a, a strict regime and really doesn't pose a lot of restrictions on what countries can and can't do. There's such a wide variation um, in in terms of uh, you know, what the voters will allow to happen when it comes to making uh, cuts now for the for the sake of the future um, we, we talked quite a bit about uh, the role of events like the, um, the the yellow vest protests in France kind of uh, putting a break on ambitious economic policy making uh, with a far future focus and how uh, environmental economists who advise politicians have to balance what the models tell us are the most efficient outcomes with what's politically possible. And that has been a, a theme throughout the class. Um, one of the things that's fascinating about this pandemic is that suddenly things that used to be you know, politically impossible until March suddenly are possible. And when, when we take this analogy seriously between pandemic policy and long-term uh, environmental uh, policy, uh, we can actually uh, you know, we, can, we can actually try out some of these thought experiments in real life that we've kind of always been curious about, um, so that we, we don't have to rely on you know, finding a regime that's actually tried out, let's say, an ambitious kind of cap and trade program. Instead, we can look at how these countries are you know are are desperately trying to restart their economies or find ways to have a lockdown that still permits uh, economic activity, and we can draw analogies to some of the really tough choices in in climate change uh, mitigation. So uh, this is yet another reason why I'm so excited to have you here, Sibyl, and also to uh, to bring Anna's expertise in um, in time perspective profiling into play. Just one more word about that. Um, so I mean, there are a lot of reasons to find time perspective fascinating. Uh, personal reasons, for example. I mean, it, you, you know, you can learn a lot about how you work as an individual. I think for for economists, w w what we find so especially fascinating about it is that it can shed light on population segmentation in policymaking. Because, you know, I mean, if you want to get a policy to actually be implemented, you, you know, if it's a democracy you're talking about, you have to get public backing for it. Even if it's not a democracy, if you have people revolting in the streets, it's probably not going to work. So it's very helpful to know something about the culture and also about the subgroups, with the subcultures within the culture that have a political voice. And being able to, you know, to, to, to type not only individuals, but also groups and look and, and make predictions uh, on that, that basis. What kind of policies will fly? What will be attractive? What won't? This is input that economists have learned the hard way that we have to take into account because we can't just go with what the models tell us is the most efficient outcome if it's not going to be politically possible. So we have to be able we have to be able to negotiate with the reality that our models have such difficult time capturing. So this is why I think having a conversation with all of us is just like it's a dream team. And 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 everyone else who's come here from the Time Perspective Network, you also have so much to contribute to this conversation. Okay, thank you, David, by the way, for this nice, kind uh, introduction. Uh, actually, I, I feel pretty much the same about this link uh, nowadays, because uh, as you said uh, a few minutes ago, uh, what seemed to be impossible some several months ago is now all of a sudden uh, quite possible and quite being implemented. And uh, I remember uh, talking about my research again. I remember when we had written about the Turkish energy policy that uh, should be changed in a way to combat climate change, in a way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, 
it will uh, definitely have implications for economic development, for economic uh, growth of the country. And then the numbers were uh, seem, seem were seeming to be quite, you know, uh, horrifying for some policy makers. And we were trying to uh, focus on the um, other side effects of making an environmental uh, policy. Because uh, yes, uh, even though you can, you have to, um, you have to, you know, uh, make some strict uh, reductions in some sectors, which will uh, lead to lower value added, lower growth of some of these specific carbon intensive sectors in the economy. And even though it will also decrease the uh, gross domestic product of an economy, in the end, there will be some additional byproducts, other win situations. And if you can, uh, let's say, accompany this kind of an environmental policy with one that corrects for the negative impacts on employment, on, let's say, investments, on uh, exports, etc., then you can uh, actually correct for the macroeconomic indicators as well. And then there comes the, uh, let's say, uh, which which policy should come first question. And now we can immediately see that, yes, COVID-19 uh, policies come first because it's quite immediate from everyone's time perspective, as I can see it uh, like that. So uh, I think we need to have a change regarding our perceptions of climate change in such a way as well. Yes, and that's that's why. So, uh, like we were so inspired by this uh, small cartoon that uh, David has shown in the beginning. That I mean, like because the uh, uh, the pandemic like really entered everybody's field, and it really became the figure. But somehow the uh, the climate change is somewhere in the background. It's not really touching me somehow yet, or it depends where you live. World. So of course, it's kind of like maybe more closer or more distant. And so that's why the uh, the behavior is also very different in this regards. And that's, uh, I think it's uh, also this, uh, the thought experiment and uh, that we conducted with David and the results, like what David has mentioned, that in terms of there are different groups of population that respond to a particular policy in a different way, and they would favor a particular policy in a different way, or they would be kind of uh, considering this uh, one particular policy, but uh, motivating uh, themselves to participate it, in it from a different uh, backgrounds. And that is also very fascinating. I think that's what we kind of like, uh, we found out in our small, uh, small experiment. But also uh, what I wanted to say is kind of like to link, I, I think uh, the situation now and this case, uh, it's uh, also a very good illustration in terms of we have those uh, different levels of time that we can there is the personal time or kind of like a micro time in which I live and I organize my own being. And then there is the macro time in which the different processes are happening. And then, of course, there is the my, me as an individual and me as part of the group. And this is like different levels of this uh, being in time and kind of like operating with this time is also, uh, we can see these different levels in the, in the experiment I think that we've done and they, how, how do they link in kind of like together. And uh, I think also in terms of the, uh, uh, the environmental issues mo for most of them is kind of like we can't see the effect immediately. There is always uh, a temporal delay. And I think with the COVID-19, that was something very similar. There is this temporal delay of two weeks. Did I get infected or not? And then it's like, should I go and kind of like tell other authorities, okay, I've been there and there, maybe I've met more people, and this, or how do people kind of like solve this issue in terms of this temporal delay, and then how it is also um, kind of like playing it out in a, in a countrywide scenario as well, in terms of how the, what, what type of policy do people kind of like pull out because of this temporal delay also. So I think there are like some parallels that we could kind of uh, bring in also together in terms of so how people react to what is actually 
been now at our plate was what is happening to right here, right now. And also how does that also change this kind of like a, I'm trying to go away, like a longer, like, you know, temporal perspective in terms of how do then we also react to the future? And so that's, I think, is also very interesting to kind of to play around because if we, uh, take most of the things which are co connected to climate change, then we see that the consequences usually go beyond a single generation. So even if we change our behavior now, most likely we will not uh, feel those effects, but hopefully our kids will. <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of like, and maybe not, maybe only our grandkids. It's kind of like, it's also difficult, difficult to foresee how this actually temporal delay will kind of play out now. And, uh, but it's uh, what we also shown before that it's, uh, it's very difficult also to kind of operate with those different uh, temporal uh, dimensions, as you can say. Okay, COVID-19 became like a, something like a, an interesting uh, thing that like a playground also in, in this regards, because usually uh, I would kind of like give an example of a nuclear waste, because the nuclear waste uh, is like it will be something like it has an extremely long time span. Uh, people say around 100,000 years. Actually, nobody exactly knows, <laughs> but that's like an estimated number. But even this estimated number, we can't imagine. It's like we don't have this cognitive capacity to operate with this uh, extremely long time spans. Because like, what is it, uh, like, uh, what is it for me 10,000, uh, 10, 100,000 years from now? It's kind of like, so how do I need to change my behavior now, like in terms of to, uh, to kind of, you know, to relate to something that is really, really far away from me. And if you even look on the, on the scale of the, of the civilizations, okay, our known civilizations is, is what, like, I don't know, if, if we take the starting point as uh, uh, Christ was born 2000 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> and there's so many things have changed even within this uh, kind of like, you know, time span. What is going to happen within hundred thousand of years? And it's like how many uh, world wars we just had within hundred years. It's, it's kind of like it's interesting to kind of to, uh, to manipulate. It's also very difficult to communicate to people. Uh, that whatever we do now is actually having an effect. And so I think that's kind of uh, where this uh, micro time and um, uh, macro time is kind of connected. And I find it extremely fascinating and also, but also extremely important to figure out how does this link work? And that's, uh, and what can we do actually in order to uh, make it work in a better way? So that's, uh, that's kind of like uh, uh, where we are kind of, you know, in, a, in the way here. And uh, what I was mentioning, I don't know if, if somebody wants to react or kind of like uh, com comment something. Civil, yes, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as you have just told, Anna, I had never uh, told about this micro and macro time perspectives, but uh, there is a way that I conduct these issues in environmental economics. Uh, so talking about environmental problems, as you have just said, yes, there, some are quite immediate. We see the impacts immediately. If there is poisonous, poisonous water that's coming out from my tap, uh, then I can deal with it immediately. But if I cannot see the effects of today's carbon dioxide emissions immediately in my life tomorrow or this year, then I may not pay attention to it. So then we need a link about these future possible effects and uh, their perception of to the in, uh, in today's world. And what we technically do is to consider these methodologies that can attach a value, right? David will agree with me, uh, to attach a value or try to attach a value to these possible costs, potential costs of pollution or uh, emissions in the future and try to bring them to today so that we discount in a way uh, the potential damages or the losses in people's welfare in well-being and we try to see whether 
the present value of these effects, although we don't see them uh, very you know, uh, clearly or definitely today, but we know that it will happen. So there is a present value that we can attach to these future problems as well, future costs as well. And then we can, okay, understand these matters or, okay, we can ignore this problem because its present value even doesn't look quite high or significant. But there, technically, it becomes a quite arbitrary, a arbitrary choices of, you know, discount rates come into play. And then uh, scientists uh, fight each other because then how to value future? Should we value it highly? Should we value it in a lower way? So that we will consider to have a change uh, starting from today. As you say, if, if I will uh, take into account my children's or grandchildren's uh, welfare, then I can uh, try to react today and uh, start mitigating uh, some of these problems uh, today. But if I don't uh, attach a high value to the future or future generations, then I can still say, okay, I have no problems with these emissions level today and I can do whatever I have been doing until now, continue with my you know, uh, routines in terms of production, consumption, other types of economic activity that has an impact on nature. So this perspective of micro macro timing uh, matches with my discounting you know, <laughs> uh, technique in the environmental economics and it matters a lot because it's about the intentions, sincere intentions uh, that will come into play whether we are really uh, focusing on such a mitigation policy or we are just ignoring uh, future and we are uh, focusing on today's uh, well-being of today's uh, generation. Okay. Could I say something? It's what these um, epidemic um, showed that actually we could make we could react immediately we could um that's it's that it showed that there could not be any future personal future immediate future and it could be very very soon not for globally but you personally and this scares people and also this scares politicians uh, very much. First of all, because most politicians are all the people, and this uh, disease affects all the people mostly. Yes, so politicians get scared, scared, and person. And now that uh, in sometimes in media we see these articles about even young people get sick and whatever, and even kids. You see, nobody talking what kind of young people did they smoke, did they, they don't smoke, did they do this or that, did they... they uh, it's just talking of scaring people really works. And what is also showed that global, global action is possible, and it has very fast effect. You probably see in in news how animals um, go to empty ne neighborhood. There is uh, this um, um, <clears throat> pollution diminished over the major cities. And of, of course, again, we see in media, uh, probably these uh, articles were commissioned that no, no, this effect not for so long. We start to have uh, again our life and there will, will be pollution again. But it's again, uh, uh, so, so there are a lot of, um, how to say it, a lot of players who try to pull the situation in different directions. And of course, we cannot uh, trust every article it's, and uh, who is written and who commissioned it and how they paid for it. But um, what it showed, global action is possible and it has fast effects. We just have to know, we just somehow have to understand I um, uh, uh, just recently, everybody probably watched this this film, Pla Planet of the Humans, and a lot of a lot of people kind of um, 
criticizing it, but it's also show, shown that no technological um, uh, solution is possible, that we have to do something global, globally and personally, because that could not be any personal future very fast, not just for humanity or for the universe, but for you personally. That scared people. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Olga. And I just have also like a brief introduction. So Olga Ast is a multidisciplinary artist. And so she's based in uh, New York and she's doing also very interesting uh, or installations and uh, very interesting projects also kind of combining uh, the science and other work. And uh, I think what is, uh, uh, I would like to kind of elaborate a little bit. Of course, we can see that the global action is possible, but why it is possible. And I think it's also very, uh, was very uh, nicely pointed, uh, pointed out by Olga, that people got scared. And most of the time, what we can see that uh, most of the uh, this uh, sustainable behavior, why people act sustainably, it is out of fear or it is out of guilt. But you can't uh, kind of, it's uh, it's not a sustainable motivation, <laughs> if I must say. <laughs> so it's like uh, you can't really uh, run on fear or guilt for a very long time. You will burn out eventually. And so that's also I am exploring in my other project uh, on this futurization of thinking and behavior in terms of the possibilities of empathy. And I think in our uh, in our this thought experiment, we also at least this one group that is uh, motivating also their uh, motivating their choice of uh, of the uh, uh, of the policy also based uh, on the on the empathy. It is always a very small part of population, but I'm very hopeful on that small part. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm trying also to figure out also like how to build up this empathy in more people. And that's kind of like uh, interesting uh, things going on there. And yeah, David, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's the perfect segue. I want to make sure, I mean, I really want to give uh, all, everyone who's here a chance to talk as well. But I want to make sure also for the students' sake, for, since we, we really picked their brains and we were also kind of sneaky about it. I mean, the first stage, we didn't tell them why we put them in the groups we did. And then afterwards we revealed, then we asked them to keep talking once we told them why. I, I want to just make sure we spend a couple minutes on the on the data. I mean, Anna and I haven't really had time to really dig into it much, but we've taken a quick look and there, it's it's absolutely amazing. And it's and I'm going to draw the connection to what uh, Anna just said about, um, you know, the populations are segmented. People act uh, for different motivations also at different times. One factor that I think is implicit in Olga's comment, also in what, what, what you just said, and also when, when Savia was talking about discount rates, you know, one reason why we, we love uh, discount rates is they find you, it's a way to make the future present. You have to discount it, but then once you've done that, then you have then then you found a way to bring future worries, future harms, future benefits into a language that people can understand. They can exchange for present goods, and that's really that really really matters a lot. Um, and one reason why it's so important to do that, um, and to do that from above, or, or to make sure that society as a whole gets on board with the particular discount rate that you decide on in a policy is that uh, you can really uh, nudge people to behave in ways that are quite different from their, you could say, inborn, or I don't know, you can talk another time maybe about to the extent to which it's inborn, time perspective, uh, of the, the profile that, that, that d displays itself in their personal lives when they're, when they're not being watched, when they realize that they're being watched and that their behavior is being logged and observed and that they're being judged based on it, um, people will, will be, be suddenly be, very flexible and often very cooperative um, and uh, and things that I guess we were saying before that weren't really possible uh, suddenly become possible and I'm going to show you an example of this and I'll try to do it in a way where the the particular group uh, well you'll probably know who you are but but you know others in the class won't quite the, the point isn't to embarrass anyone at all it's just to show that there are some really funny things that happen when you uh, tell people they're part of 
an experiment um, that that are for econo for from an economics perspective, especially like a behavioral or political economy perspective, they reveal a lot to us about this gap that I mentioned before between model <laughs> model and reality. Usually, the, you know, the way it works is you have a model, you have reality, and the thing in between them is psychology and politics. <laughs> and we economists, we know we unfortunately we've learned from experience we have a lot to learn from psychology and politics. So these interdisciplinary collaborations are fantastic. But let me really quickly show you what our data looks like. So um, this is not all of the data. This is a, this is just a sort of first pass at taking the what we learned from the different groups. And uh, in the in the you can't see the identities of the groups here. Uh, maybe later on, if the class really wants me to, I'll share that with them. But we have some groups that we that that Anna and I grouped according to uh, some traits that their the individual survey results revealed. And um, really quickly, we put them to through a, a two stage um, kind of surveying process, where um, I constructed uh, five. Uh, country profiles that contain some brief histories of each country's COVID-19 response. We added each country's um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, the Hofstede index. I can't remember the name, but Hofstede, uh, uh, maybe I'll ask Anna to tell me what the official name is, but Hofstede's index of sort of cultural behavioral traits for each country so students could, could get an idea of, kind of where this response might have been coming from culturally. Um, and then we asked the students before telling them why they were grouped together to uh, to give brief profiles of how they would imagine themselves feeling if they were, um, on the one hand, a, a citizen in the country living through this policy intervention. And then on the other hand, somebody behind the wheel, someone in the policymaking team. And so with the green um descriptions here and I've taken long summaries and very subjectively just extracted one or two key words about the emotional tone of the response and put them in here and so in the, the green area you can see the citizen responses in the purplish area you can see the policymaker responses and that was stage one and then we uh, we did a big reveal and Anna gave a lecture on how uh, time uh, time perspective profiles work and uh, and then and then Anna gave each group an individual little uh, snippet of video, a little, uh, just a, a little bit of insight to why it was that we put precisely those students together. And then armed with this information about who we think they are, we then asked them to, to choose among the five countries that they'd been, that they'd been you know, doing imaginative profiles of, them. well, which country would you really rather live in or rather contribute to? Um, and you can see that uh, Korea was very popular, um, and uh, and that's kind of interesting because not all of the groups that that chose Korea had actually uh, reported in the first round that they would be happiest uh, in Korea. Um, and then there were a couple of groups that, even though in their uh, responses in the green and 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 purple areas, so before they knew kind of who they were, uh, had actually um, seemed to you know greatly prefer living in Korea or Germany or something like that. When they were asked to choose a country in light of their known profile, they chose countries that are quite different from what you would expect if all you had were their stage one responses. And I mean, um, well, the way I, I've highlighted this is you can see that in the left-hand part of the, or the most of the screen, the stage one part of the screen, I've put some of the adjectives in bold. And the ones in bold are the adjectives corresponding to the countries that the group ended up choosing in stage two after the time perspective profile was revealed. Um, and you can see, if you, for example, take this group that shall remain nameless, um, that, uh, that Anna and I had typed as, as being characterized by a, by a combination of remarkably past positive, future, past, future positive traits. Um, when they learned that, uh, that that was the that was their identity. Um, they ended up choosing uh, Korea and maybe as a second choice Denmark. And what's funny about that is that back in their original responses, they reported that if they were living in Korea, they'd feel extremely anxious and frustrated by the policy approach. And even as policymakers, they would feel stressed and uneasy. And this was referring also in the Korea profile, I discussed the, the history of the pandemic in, in Korea, which as you might know, things were going fine. And then a particular patient, patient 31, 
who was a member of a, a, a church group that didn't believe in you know, modern medicine, went and infected a thousand people. And then suddenly the, the pandemic was very, very difficult to control. And then they managed to control it. So this group, um, right, in, really in keeping with their time perspective profile, um, reported that uh, life in, in Korea with its its great you know, control and, 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 a, and a very you know, long term perspective um, was really not for them, neither as a citizen or a policymaker. But later on, when they were kind of in the spotlight, they did choose Korea. And it's, it's not that that choice is inauthentic by any means, but it reflects the differences between how people behave when they know that they're being judged and how people behave you know, when, when they don't. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now. I could go on. There's so much fascinating stuff in the data. But um, for, uh, for economists with an interest in practical policy, this is really, really fascinating. Um, it shows how important it is when we design nudges uh, to take into account uh, when we want to observe people, when we want to let them know that they're being observed, and how, and this gets back to, to Anna's methodology and to the studies that Seidel has done on, on these country comparisons, how do we take culture and subcultural differences into account in advance when we design the parameters of, let's say, a some kind of flexible policy that allows for different groups to react in different ways. So I hope this gives uh, everyone here, and especially the students who are our guinea pigs, a sense of why this is actually of you know, scientific value. I mean, you know, we didn't do, we didn't have the ability to do this in the kind of controlled way that we would like to. But I mean, for us, this is, this is as researchers, this is extremely uh, inspiring to see what we can do with a group of just 48 students. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you, David, for uh, for this uh, uh, introduction of uh, of the results. Because yeah, it's, there are so many interesting things, and it's uh, very in, uh, also fascinating to see both like the the uh, uh, the before and kind of like after effects, but also in terms of uh, how uh, this. Um, also, like, how can we actually apply it? And this is a, a great illustration, actually, of uh, what we've been discussing also in the Time Perspective Network, I think, a couple of times in terms of that. Uh, if we are trying to motivate uh, people, there is no one way. There is kind of like there is no just one golden standard. It always has to be done done in multiple ways because people do have their individual differences in terms of what are their preferences in terms of and we all have all of those three temporal modalities with us we have our own past present and future but we have like a, a variety of uh, how do you, you can say like accentuation in a way so we, sometimes we shift towards the future sometimes we shift towards the past or there is this combination of all of those three and thus uh, it makes us also successful uh, kind of like success to a particular message. So if we are living more in the future, then we kind of like we understand more in terms of uh, this uh, idea of the sustainable behavior, that it's something that we need to do now for the greater good. We might never experience, but other people will. And we are actually kind of, we understand this logic behind better. But if a person li is living in the past and we are trying to sell them the idea about to do something for the future, it's going to be very difficult. You would need to speak to that person in their language and maybe try to kind of wrap around maybe the same type of policy, but in a different, uh, in, um, how do you call it like this, the candies they have like a wrapping, like in a different package so that the, they would understand the message in the language that is more closer to them. And then it becomes uh, not the background, but it becomes the figure for them as well. And they would start to act uh, upon it as well. So that's, I think, uh, some of the uh, uh, students' responses here, they're really illustrative of this. And that's something that I would uh, love to kind of also to dive in a little bit more and uh, explore further if uh, uh, this uh, uh, also the time would allow us to do that. But it's uh, something very similar kind of what we showed in our uh, thought experiment when we had the simulation study. So we kind of we tried to kind of bridge the gap in terms of, yeah, we have this empirical data uh, from real people living in real countries. And then we try to kind of like make them interact with each other in a particular way. And so that's where we are trying to also show that some of the economic models maybe also need to include 
exclude this irrationality of the human being and not just kind of like use this, uh, how do you call it, this uh, uh, homo economics or something that is like acts like as a one or zero. But uh, the humans are kind of more, uh, there is uh, more things that they do between uh, zero and one. <laughs> and so that's what we're kind of like trying to uh, uh, to show there as well. And we, uh, and it was very interesting that uh, as I was mentioning before that the, the very first result was, okay, yeah, we have those uh, like seven profiles of people that we can trace uh, across 20 something countries, but the population composition is very different. So in one country, you have like a type number seven, uh, number seven is the one that is the, the most populous and uh, type number one will be like less populous, but in another country, it's vice versa. So the dynamics of those interactions are also going, going to be very different. And what we did, we kind of like, we, take, uh, we took this uh, real life situation that happened in Netherlands in the late seventies, when a small village gets cut off from the main electricity supply and and so they have a, a blacksmith with a generator. It's powerful enough. So they kind of, they hook up the whole village, which is about 150 households. But of course you can't live the same uh, comfortable life when you have a generator and not the main electricity supply. So you establish some certain rules, like you can't uh, open your uh, curtains. So you, you kind of, you try to keep the heat inside. You can use only one lamp at a time. You can't heat up your house more than 18 degrees. You're not so, uh, Celsius. You're not supposed to uh, use the heated water and some other things like this. And then not to watch, to watch TV, of course. And you would think, okay, it's a critical situation, sort of like a pandemic right now. And you would think people would follow the rules. Well, you would probably guess they, they killed the generator on the second day. <laughs> <laughs> so they manage, of course, to kind of like to repair it, but then uh, this, uh, the solution to this tragedy of the commons in this particular village was to appoint a villager, basically a policing guy, who would go around the village and trying to see who is violating the rules. So sort of a very, you know, similar uh, kind of like, uh, you, can, you can understand where I'm going with this. But if we kind of like ex uh, extrapolate this village situation, basically the village is our planet. <laughs> and we are over harvesting it. <laughs> Instead of using one lamp at a time, we are using two and we are jeopardizing the, uh, uh, this very limited capacity of the old generator. <laughs> and we are not really even sure if we can repair it if it breaks down. <laughs> But that's also like what we kind of like what we showed with our simulation. Yeah, we have those different types of people who would follow the rules or not follow the rules. They would be interacting in a different way. And then you can also see the dynamics in terms of if we want to uh, is like a reach a particular kind of status quo in this village, like so how many people or what is the ratio in terms of what type of types we need to have in that village and how many. And also how long it takes for the other types who were very not following the rules to actually adopt the new uh, behavior pattern. And so we kind of, we played a little bit with that. And that was also a, a thought experiment with uh, some uh, uh, empirical data inside and uh, all sorts of other things. And, uh, but once we got the results, actually, uh, maybe I, I can share this uh, uh, again. So, but we build up this uh, is uh, what we call as a, uh, the index of cooperators for, for different countries. And so I think this is something also that we can uh, kind of uh, maybe see uh, and apply uh, also la later on with, uh, in, in other things as well. And that's uh, kind of like, it gives also some interesting insights here, which uh, I love the uh, example of Sweden <laughs> in this one, because it's like, I live there, but also it's very interesting. Like you would think, okay, like Sweden is also like Denmark out, uh, you know, being in the uh, very in front, uh, out front, like with the, all of the different sustainability policies and stuff. But that's kind of like, it brings us to this village example. So they are behaving sustainably only when they are inside that village and they are policed. 
because and that's why you can see that kind of like the Sweden is not very kind of like their uh, index cooperation is actually not not so high and then uh, there have been like a couple of examples with that, that actually, if you look at what IKEA was doing in Brazil, or when it was also like the crisis of 2008, 2009, actually a lot of Swedish people took advantage of uh, like, for example, buying land in Latvia and just, you know, cutting down the forest for profit because it is possible to do it there and it's not possible to do in Sweden. So it depends on like, you know, in, in, in which type of village you're living. <laughs> is there a guy going around this village and policing you or not type of things and then it's kind of like of course yeah this was uh, like a thought experiment we could not really put you know people from you know 150 people from sweden and in the into this uh, kind of like village uh, experiment live that would not be very ethical and leave them there without any electricity and uh, but that's uh, but this uh, proxy actually shows uh, shows some interesting things that we also uh, validated uh, correlating with uh, with some other things so that's, I think, also like um, I would like to like uh, see. and also if we look uh, in the uh, the world over shoot day, for example, metric as well. That uh, also shows uh, some interesting things uh, there uh, in terms of both like Sweden and Denmark. Uh, they're not really kind of like being uh, uh, up in front with the, with the, with these things. So that's uh, kind of like a very, uh, uh, I don't know if um, um, any, any questions, uh, reactions, comments. I, I see that we are uh, approaching our hour, but I, I think we can also have a couple of questions uh, going on, right, David? Yes. Yeah, I see Olga wants to ask. Yeah. Um, it, it's not so much a question, it's comment. Um, the, um, I would like comment uh, comment on energy consumption. It's probably one of the main critical points to this uh, Michael Moore film, uh, Planet of Humans. There are uh, right now we couldn't um, because main point of the, of the film that we have reduced energy uh, consumptions consumption. But right now to talk about it, it's kind of very, you know, how to say it, it's became you know, very difficult because we have, a, a, especially uh, among young people, the whole, uh, a lot of um, people who are uh, mining Bitcoin and consider it's like a future of humanity and uh, which leads us to new like utopian um, existence uh, and it's extremely it's it, it use extreme um, uh, amount of energy and I heard that for example one uh, guy in Russia bought the whole power station just for producing um, uh, mining bitcoins so Right now, it's became, and it's probably uh, main people who criticizing Michael Mood now. It's that kind of people. So, how in this situation we can uh, talk about um, reducing energy consumption if part of the society consider it's exactly energy consumption that go lead us to uh, utopian future. That's kind of the question. It's mostly rhetorical question, but it's still question. <laughs> uh, shall I take a stab at it, uh, Anna? Yeah, yeah I, th I think it's a very important point to bring up. I, I think one, one, um, one feature of the political debate about coronavirus policy, and I know that the students who are, and you're also Olga in New York, the, the people who are living through this in, in the U.S., um, you know, in the U.S., everything becomes polarized, politically polarized. I mean, all the way. Uh, and uh, and looking at this from Europe, I mean, I'm American, but I've been living in Europe for so long that I, I, also, I also really find it weird sometimes. But every so often, something strange happens, and the, the usual polarization sort of flips around. So right now, we're seeing a lot of protests against the lockdown. 
And a lot of the protests are fueled by the idea that the lockdowns themselves are causing so much uh, long-term economic harm that it is a short-sighted measure. This is the view of many of the protesters driven by fear. Um, and that if people were thinking long-term, they would accept the sacrifices that it takes to get the population to reach herd immunity, um, accept the deaths that that would take, because this would be for everyone's long-term benefit. And what's, what's kind of ironic and, and almost funny, I mean, I don't want to joke about this, but is that many of the people who are advocating for that position, when faced with uh, arguments that we need to restrict our energy consumption for the sake of the long-term health of society, would be on the on the short-term side of the debate. So it's it's really interesting to see how in this epidemic, you know, it, 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 you know, who's on what side kind of gets gets turned around. And actually, on, on that note, I, I want to mention that um, I want to say something to the students about uh, the way that we set up the study. Uh, this is a, a little note, but it's, it's relevant to the whole thing. Back when we created the country profiles, I was just personally very concerned about news out of South Korea that uh, hundreds of people who had been infected and recovered had tested positive again weeks later for this virus, which was a very disturbing finding. And it suggested that perhaps uh, immunity is not something that one can get. And just today, just yesterday, the Korean, um, uh, minister, uh, uh, the Korean Centers for Disease Control uh, published the results of, they'd, they'd been sur intensively following these people to find out what happened. And they determined that actually this was this was a problem that had to do with testing. They have such uh, precise testing measurements in Korea that they were actually picking up dead virus particles that are not live and cannot infect people. And this is, I just want to say, this is such an amazing relief uh, to learn that actually it turns out, well, maybe immunity is possible. Um, so that was a very sort of scary data point that we now have a different interpretation of. Anyway, what's interesting about that is it, it, this whole question of to what extent is immunity possible, to what extent is herd immunity possible? In, in, in the American context, it feeds right into this. It's grist for the mill of people who are really uh, uh, ferociously calling for lockdowns to be lifted. And you know, the, the idea is usually you put everybody over 65 or 70, you put them in their house for six months, and then you accept whatever the outcome is. And, what, and just to return to the point I was making in, in general, is that um, it, it, is that the idea that energy consumption um, is, is is something that everyone ought to have access to and it ought to be unrestricted can, uh, can usually it appears as a very short sighted perspective, but in the context of this debate, it's just fascinating to listen to the rhetoric. All of a sudden, that that gets taken up um, in, in the view of many of these lockdown uh, these lockdown skeptics as as the only uh, responsible long term thing to do. And I think my overall point isn't so much to talk about that particular debate, but to see that to say that. One, one, one amazing learning opportunity that comes of a crisis like this is by, by turning the usual polarizations on its head, it allows us to ask about the, the, the deep underlying psychological motivations that lead people to be attracted to one kind of policy approach or another. And ultimately, I mean, I think one point that, that Anna mentioned before that really, that really uh, is important to, to bring up is that um, um, compassion really feeling for the people who are um, the, the individual uh, sufferers. You know, in, in economics, we often say, well, there are winners and there are losers to whatever policy you choose. But to really take the plight of the losers seriously and ask, I mean, how, what precautions are we willing to take to keep that number of, of losers as small as possible? This is a moral question. It's an ethical question. It's an economic question. But it's also a psychological question. Uh, because the, the makeup, the attitudes towards past, present, and future that people have toward their personal future, how personally they take these phenomena, has a tremendous influence on the moral instincts that come come forward in the political choices that they make. Mm, could I say something? Um, uh, actually, my mother was a doctor in the Soviet Union. And most doctors in the Soviet Union were very good because there was no so, so much um, technology and medication. And we discussed these uh, questions actually about all this, what is going right now in, these, in this time, in this um, epidemi epi no, e epidemic. And I don't know, but I could say something if we have a couple of minutes, but I think we don't know. We don't have already that much. Anna, could I say something about it or it's, it's uh, time? 
David? Um, I would say we can go until 5.15. Mm -hmm. So we have seven minutes in total. Yeah, we have a, a couple more minutes. <laughs> okay. So so the the, the question was, uh, she talked to me because she worried about my future. She talked to me about how fast body chemistry changes with new chemicals, like new medications. And what is now going on, that is, especially in the United States, I have some, uh, after, after thinking about it, I, have, I start to have some ideas what is going on. Generally, uh, uh, it's a lot of diabetics and overweight people, also people who on a lot of medication, they are kind of in bigger danger. It's not about um, underlying condition, it's mostly, I think, that they change chemistry of the body and virus get adopted, evolved to this new chemistry. And young people, mostly healthy, and especially kids, and they don't have changed changed uh, chemistry because they don't have, don't uh, take this drug. And also they have good immunity because they have, uh, from the young age, they have immunization. And um, that what is, um, uh, yeah, and of course, there is a big scare for, for pharmaceutical industry. Who is going to to take these drugs after all these people, like 17? What, what, how are they going to make a profit? So I don't think there will be any kind of research in this, in this case. But, and also there is other thing in, in like earlier in the same, in last century, in two centuries ago, there were more kids in society than all the people. So viruses adapted more easily to younger people. Because there were more uh, this um, material to adapt these these bodies with this uh, chemistry, but now we have more older people. So for viruses, it's it's kind of they evolve to adapt to all the people, at least in this case. So and there is should be research how all the chemistry, especially all the people on what kind of medication. Uh, and so, but I'm not sure, maybe it's easier in smaller country like Denmark, but then in the United States. And especially again, with the, um, uh, when the uh, United States economy established on... So that's one of my... Um, I don't know, questions, would we be able really investigate what caused um, these um, uh, complications after the uh, particular people get this virus? And also about these viruses, yes, it's first of all, after testing, it was uh, dead viruses, but also we all always have some kind, a lot of viruses in the body, but body can, can resist them. You see, it's so, it's, uh, we have so much uh, microbiology, and there are some pathological viruses, but they are not, not infected us because and only when we became weaker, then. So, so, so it's, uh, so that's some, my, no, yes, it's, some, it's some very, my, it's about very what it's going on. Uh, very complex uh, system that uh, I think uh, uh, many researchers are going to look into and hopefully we can find uh, some answers. But I see, yeah, we are approaching our hour. So I don't know if, uh, if there are any of the students who have any comments or uh, questions. Maybe, the, yeah, if you would like to ask or like put them in the chat. And, uh, but it's, I don't know if any, uh, if Civil, uh, if you have any uh, last uh, comments to, uh, to our session. Well, I would like to thank uh, you all, actually. Uh, this session made me think uh, about the COVID-19 in a different way, radically different way. <laughs> I must admit that. 
I was trying to ignore a little bit uh, what's going on, although I'm, you know, keeping myself and my family as, uh, you know, protected as possible. Uh, still, I'm fed up with all these things going on, so I was trying to not to think much about it. But this time, this has been a good link about what I'm doing in my research, in my, you know, uh, special interest area, and uh, this... Uh, I mean, this problem that we are already living in uh, or in the middle of. So um, I can find lots of analogies that Olga has uh, throw, thrown onto the table and what David has also said and what you have wrote onto the table as well. So between psychological uh, perspectives and economic perspectives, I now can uh, construct a bridge much, easy, much more easily. Uh, and I'm now thinking about this time uh, perspective in a really different way. Thank you for that. Uh, and I also want to make this analogy of Olga uh, to environments as such. So the world is uh, in a situation where, uh, or the planet, let's say, is in a situation where it has been uh, too much intervened and, uh, you know, tried to be cured in different ways is now, uh, you know, not as before. So whatever we are doing in order to cure it further and further, it has some positive and negative effects that we cannot control all the time. So maybe uh, starting from uh, the points that you uh, introduced, who will be correcting it? Who will be the, you know, minority that will have the chance to influence the whole society, the uh, planetary society, to make a change. Actually, that's a, that's a matter of communication as well as culture. Uh, that's, I think, what we should uh, consider from now on about the things that we already know as they are right or wrong, how to communicate this information to the people who are maybe in a way less long-sighted. Uh, maybe not concerned about the future so much. So we should find ways to communicate and understand, as you say, their cultural backgrounds, their time uh, uh, perspectives as well. So thanks again for inviting me. Thank you so much for joining, David. Any, uh, also yes, actually, I, I, what Seva just said, I find incredibly inspiring. And, and, it, and Seva, your, your words make me think of where we're going to be in about six months, maybe a year's time. Because so I mentioned before how interesting I find it that the roles have kind of flipped, and those who want to put the uh, more short-term economic interests uh, as we traditionally thought of it, actually now in the debate about lockdowns and more restrictive policies, these are the people who are saying, "No, we're the ones who have the long-term uh, interests of society at heart." Those who want to keep their children at home and keep you know keep keep keep, uh, keep stores closed and things like that. Are, are, are really just plugging into this short-term fear. It's, it's a fascinating role reversal. And what I see, and I'm really inspired by what you said before, it, it, it's a thought that just came to me, looking six months or a year ahead, is we're gonna see it flip back again when the time comes to discuss how we recover from the pandemic. And a lot of people in the community of environmental activists and also environmental economists are, are really uh, scratching our heads right now, trying to figure out how can we plan for a green recovery and make a green recovery an attractive political option uh, for uh, for populations that are really suffering, uh, especially individuals who are who have lost their jobs or are furloughed and waiting to see what will happen. Um, and I think that we have a historic opportunity to do exactly what Savio was talking about before, to communicate across political boundaries. And you know, I'm American, so I'm used to this extreme polarization. Um, where, where you have people who believe in, in, in markets and their markets will solve all problems sort of by themselves and, and people who are, no, you have to intervene. Well, we have, we're in a situation now where the, the people who really want to, to free the, the economy um, are, are trying out the role of, of arguing for uh, the, the long-term health that will require short-term sacrifices. And I think having, having experienced that kind of political role reversal can open up room for communication across the divide in a way that I, I hope can build some new um, 
uh, some well, new bridges, but also new communities of interest that in an American context can, uh, can segment people in ways that are a little bit less boring and a little bit less, uh, less dry and barren than the usual political polarization that we've been used to when talking about environmental policy in an American context for the last uh, 30, 35 years. So that's a very hopeful uh, feeling that I have after listening to all of you, and especially Savia's uh, last words. You really, uh, you really inspired me and made me feel hopeful uh, uh, about uh, where we're going in six months, a year, and beyond. Yes, thank you, uh, everyone. It's been a lovely session. Uh, I think it's uh, also a lot of different opinions and a lot of different thoughts, and uh, very hopeful uh, at the, at our conclusion. And uh, I would like to again uh, say thank you to everybody who joined us today, and uh, just also to bridge a little bit for further for the not so far away future. We have a couple more sessions planned. So one is actually with the uh, with the therapist. So she's going to talk about kind of like how the pandemic affected her as also like working style but also like what type of like cases uh, she is dealing with and how she's dealing with them and then we also have uh, Sheldon Solomon who is going to talk about the terror management theory and so like kind of like this uh, you know and uh, how, how we kind of relate it also now to this like so that we have this global anxiety in terms of the death uh, looming onto us and so how we can do, how we can manage that and then after that we also have a, t a team Nestic, so he who is going to talk about the attitudes towards the global risks which are also included of course like the pandemic and some other things so there and there, there are a couple more things in the in the planning so stay tuned <laughs> and thank you so much uh, once again for today thank you so much Anna thank you bye thanks thank bye bye so bye nice to meet you all great to meet you <laughs> yes, very nice thank you everyone for participating <laughs>